under the tropical seas of our planet lies one of the most intricate worlds ever evolved, coral reefs. Covering only one-tenth of one percent of the Earth's surface, built by the ceaseless efforts of delicate creatures no bigger than a baby's finger. Yet they achieve the highest productivity of all marine ecosystems, second only to the tropical rainforests in complexity and richness. Some of the most exquisite reefs on Earth grace the little known waters of the Indian Ocean off southern Africa. Yet these secret realms, like coral reefs everywhere, are suffering. As global warming accelerates and the thermometers rise, the narrow niche that corals occupy is being squeezed out of existence. For the past decade, Peter and Stefania Lamberti have been filming the wonders of the Indian Ocean. Whilst working here, we've noticed that although the reefs are very delicate and do suffer from diver and fisherman damage and are sometimes affected very badly by cyclonic conditions, they are still very resilient because they always seem to be able to come back and repair themselves. I've thoroughly enjoyed exploring new reefs of the Indian Ocean and have realized that our African reefs are just as wonderful and just as rich as the more well-known Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Over the years, Peter and Stefania have discovered a breathtakingly beautiful world. Intriguing, colorful, exotic. Home to more than a quarter of all known fish species. Some of their favorite sites fringe the high volcanic islands of the Comores, an archipelago lying between the coast of Mozambique and Madagascar. These jewel-like islands are among the Indian Ocean's most prolific ecosystems. The huge flanks of the volcanoes providing footholds for large reef systems, which in turn provide homes for tropical fish, crustaceans, sharks, rays, and every other manner of life that finds its way in from the ocean. But in the course of the decade that Peter and Stefania have been coming to the Comores, they've seen alarming changes. A lot of the coral is bleached white and some of it is covered in algae. And I just can't help wondering what effect this is having on the fish life that relies on the coral for survival. This is a very serious problem and the world needs to find out about it. I mean, it's like an avalanche. Dead corals, no reefs, no reefs, no fish, and no food not only for the marine inhabitants, but for humankind as well. Coral bleaching occurs when reefs become stressed from increasing water temperatures, from pollution or other yet unknown causes. Pandemics of coral bleaching have swept the world's reefs for the last few decades. But in recent years, these outbreaks have grown more frequent and more widespread. Today, the future of coral reefs is in doubt. Most hard reef-building corals are part animal, part plant. The coral polyp itself is a tiny animal, catching zooplankton with its stinging tentacles, usually by night. Yet, living within the coral's calcium home are algae, called zooxanthellae, which give the corals their lovely colors. But they also perform functions vital to the long-term survival of their hosts. In return for a home to live in, the zooxanthellae photosynthesize in the process, they recycle the wastes produced by the coral animal, turning them into carbohydrates. Some of these carbohydrates are then used by the coral as food. Although corals actively snare zooplankton from the water, recent studies show that corals receive more than half their daily nutrients from the zooxanthellae, and some receive 100% of their food this way. The healthy coral reef is colorful and crowded. A flutter with fish. 
lobsters and shrimp tucked into small holes. Moray eels snaking into crevices. And sharks patrolling. But when a reef comes under stress, if for instance the temperature of the water rises higher than about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, the corals respond by expelling their zooxanthellae. The reefs then appear bleached. Without their algae, the corals are greatly weakened and cannot survive for long. After a two-year absence, Peter and Stefania recently returned to the Comores. They'd heard reports that the El Nino of the previous year, with its corresponding four degree increase in water temperature, had caused widespread coral bleaching here. I couldn't believe it. It is just upsetting to even think that these beautiful reefs might be dying. A whole universe that we hardly even know and we haven't discovered fully might not be there for much longer. I feel as a filmmaker it is our responsibility to show the world what is happening here in the hope that somebody can come up with a solution. Their base for exploration of the reefs is Grand Comore, the largest island of the group and the only one to boast a still active volcano, Kartala, at nearly 8,000 feet. Many of the volcanic features of these islands provide for the fantastic array of life here. Old cinder cones, now sunken and partially filled with water, host tropical forests alive with colonies of fruit bats. With wingspans of up to five feet, fruit bats fly ten or more miles a night in search of fruiting trees. By day, they sleep together in huge rookeries, tucking their wings up around them wings which act as blankets, parasols or umbrellas as the need arises. With an active volcano at its centre, Grand Comore is an island still being built. Recent lava flows have carved a path through the lush forests and into a turquoise sea. Offshore, the fringing reefs take hold on the underwater flows. Old lava tubes become caves, overhangs and crevices, where a myriad of creatures, great and small, take refuge. Ever since our first visit to Comores, this has been one of my favorite reefs. Although it's quite shallow, Almost every crevice is inhabited by one or two mores. Comoran reefs, with their honeycomb structures, are densely populated by the family of Morenidae, or moray eels. Although more than 10 species of moray inhabit the waters around Comores, all are similar in behavior. Territorial carnivores, they claim homes inside caves, emerging at night to feed on everything from small fish to crabs. Their fearsome, open-mouthed posture is a function of the way they breathe, pumping water through their mouths and over their gills. Some mores share their caves with crustaceans, such as lobsters or cleaner shrimp. Living together is beneficial to both species. Because crustaceans are a favorite food for octopus, which in turn are among the mores' tastiest dinners. So when an octopus comes out at night hunting cleaner shrimp, it's likely to fall prey to the large moray standing guard over its tiny roommate. Each reef is a delicately balanced ecosystem that has taken thousands of years to evolve. And within this system, there are many animals which are dependent on each other, forming wonderful relationships. Symbiotic relationships, where one species benefits from the presence of another, abound in the complex world of the coral reef. Anemones, the beautiful flower-like animals with an arsenal of stinging tentacles, take root on exposed walls of the reef. 
here, bathed by the currents, they feast on passing plankton. Yet living within them are small, colorful anemone fish, or clownfish. Fiercely territorial, these members of the damselfish family are not born immune to the anemone stings. Instead, they must allow themselves to be stung little by little until the toxins no longer harm them. While the clownfish live inside a virtual fortress of tentacles, they in turn provide meals for the anemone. Larger fish in the course of their pursuit may dart into the anemone after the clownfish, thereby falling prey themselves. If these tiny fish, only a few centimeters long, were as big as sharks, we wouldn't be able to dive in the, in the ocean. We wouldn't be safe. I've had them come up to my mask and bang against my mask and pull my hair, and they've even tried to bite me. But after a two-year absence from Comores, Peter and Stefania discover that the underwater world is hardly recognizable from what they knew before. As they explore old favorite dives, they find the coral slopes, reef flats and walls heavily bleached, and in places covered with smothering algae. Obviously, the increasing number and severity of El Nino events, with their corresponding rise in sea temperatures, is taking a terrible toll on these reefs. It's hard for me to believe that these coral reefs that once were so colorful and full of life now look like a war zone with hardly any living coral left. Only when they go deeper, down to 120 feet on a higher wall, do they find reefs still healthy and bountiful. At this depth, the water has remained cooler and the corals have not expelled their algae. An enormous Gorgonian fan anchors itself to the reef wall, growing perpendicular to the prevailing current. In this way, it maximizes its chance to snare plankton from the water. But sea fans, like many of the other corals at this depth, are not reef builders. Although they may thrive down here, they will not be able to replenish the parts of the reef that are lost to storms, hurricanes, or global warming. It makes me so happy when I hear the crackling sound. It means that the reef is alive. It means that the fish are eating and that the corals are growing. It's a wonderful feeling. Peter's camera lights illuminate the vibrant colors that otherwise appear lost at this depth. Down here, fish once again dance in front of his lens, including long-nosed butterfly fish, whose snouts enable them to probe crevices in the reef in search of burrowing worms, sponges, or coral polyps. This black and yellow fish is a common inhabitant of Indo-Pacific reefs. But here in Comorian waters, they display a rare mutation, a totally black version. It's always a privilege to film such a rare sight. Most divers tend to look for just the big things that live on the reefs, but here in the Comores, the reefs are particularly good for the little inhabitants. And that's what makes it more worrying these little inhabitants depend on, on the corals for their food, for their lives. And once the coral polyps start dying, what are they going to eat? Where are all these endemic fish going to go? As Peter and Stefania begin their return to the surface, they discover more and more damage. Many of the corals in the shallower parts of the reef are covered in thick green algae. Yet amazingly, fish still abound. 
the herbivorous fish pluck happily at these underwater gardens and the reef still crackles with life. Not all reefs need an underlying structure of hard corals. Artificial reefs formed by shipwrecks provide an ideal substrate for invertebrates and fish to colonize. At the wreck of the fishing trawler Masiwa, Peter and Stefania discover a thriving community of sea life. Yet the ghostly remains of this ship mark a grisly chapter in the history of the Comores Islands. In 1975, a Frenchman named Bob Denard and a band of his rebels hid out in the bowels of this trawler. They then came ashore under cover of darkness and staged a bloody coup against the presiding government. Five years later, the ship was washed onto a reef during a violent storm. Ten years after that, it was resunk closer to shore as an artificial reef, where sea life could find refuge and make a new home. This is one of my favorite wrecks because it's such a simple wreck to dive in so that I've got all the time in the world to just look at the little things and all the growth and the fish that inhabit it. Throughout the wreck, carpets of colorful algae coat the rusting carcass. All the inner rooms, which once housed fishermen and their gear, today are hideaways for fish. Often filming interiors of shipwrecks can be dangerous because there's all sorts of things that you can get your equipment snagged on. And you can kick up sediment which will impair visibility and cause you to get lost. But this ship is quite clean and easy to get around. Outside, a greater barracuda stalks the decks looking for a way in. Yet the reef building corals are absent here. Strictly speaking, they're not necessary, as the steel ship acts as a skeleton itself. Ascending slowly following the main mast and the guide rope, Peter and Stefania are accompanied by a gregarious school of batfish. It's quite alarming to think that if we don't get the problem of global warming under control, and this phenomenon continues, that we could end up with barren oceans. artificial reef of Masiwa, Peter and Stefania next set course for a seamount called Bonk Valieu, approximately 12 nautical miles southwest of Grand Comore. The two-hour trip takes them out over the deep water of the Mozambique Channel. Here a pod of spinner dolphins races towards them for an energetic ride off their bow wave. Spinner dolphins are among the smallest of their kind, averaging five feet long. They feed exclusively by night, diving hundreds of feet deep after squid and small fish. By day, they rest, or if by chance a boat motors by, they play. As Peter and Stefania approach Bonk Valieu, the spinner dolphins fall back, preferring the open water of the channel. Standing alone in the water between Mozambique and Madagascar, 
Bongfaleur is all that remains of a long extinct volcano. As its magma source dried up, the volcano eventually eroded and then subsided back into the sea. Today, its walls fall 9,000 feet to the ocean floor, attracting visitors from the pelagic or deep water zone. Schools of open water hunters like Trevallis and Lesser Barracuda patrol these sheer walls. Giant manta rays cruise through, feeding on plankton as they fly. Sharks also visit, including the giant hammerhead, one of the sea's most fearsome hunters. There is an amazing amount of life out here. They're big fish, little fish, it's got everything. This is truly one of the Indian Ocean's great dive sites. And yet even here we found dying corals and smothering algae, but they were all on the top. The area that's most affected by global warming, I suppose. But as we ventured further and further down the walls, the life was still astonishing. Because reef-building corals grow so slowly, adding only about half an inch per year, the formation of large reefs is a laborious process, taking many millennia. Sadly, the results of this hard work can be erased in just a few short years. If the corals don't continue to feed, if their algae companions can't photosynthesize, then the reefs cease growing. Without growth, every passing storm whittles them down until nothing but rubble remains. Just like rainforests, coral reefs play a very important role in the recycling of gases of the atmosphere. And it's frightening to think that the whole process of global warming might actually increase if the reefs keep dying. All the changes we've seen happening here in the Indian Ocean over the last few years have been happening to reefs all over the world. And that's a frightening thought. Perhaps, as some theorize, corals will adapt to warmer conditions and regenerate naturally. But if they don't, we can only hope that this will not be the final challenge in the long and splendid history of one of nature's most prolific creations.